good evening everyone myself dr mukesh ladda from nagpur first of all i would like to thank dr dindal sir for inviting uh, for accepting our invitation to teach us and make us understand more about reverse shoulder arthroplasty before thank before that i would like to give a big applause to our dynamic secretary of vidarbha orthopedic society dr ninan who has who is getting in into new things for vidarbha orthopedic society recently all women orthopedic talks were there now this one surgeon one technique initiative by our dynamic secretary under the aber leadership of dr dhopaukar sir our president so dr deen dal sir you are the opening batsman for this series so all over to you sir thank you mukesh so i am so happy to be back with vidarbha orthopedic society i think it was uh, four or five years ago that i was there now i am with uh, online seminar like this so we again reconnect and i just now spoke to dr mukesh and then he has already done bio rsa but uh, actually i am going to talk less about the bio, bio rsa but more about what is the basic technique in because uh, the reason i am talking about it is because uh, whenever i speak in trauma meeting nowadays a lot of people talk about reverse shoulder arthroplasty also so that is the reason I, uh, that is the reason i thought it is better to talk about reverse shoulder so in that context so what i want to tell all of you is that uh, reverse shoulder arthroplasty is relatively new relatively new in the sense in our country lot of surgeons are now taking over it as a new technique but what they all must understand is that technique should not prevail over reason so you must you must not do a technique just because you have come to know about it but you need to really get a good learning experience and then do the surgeries we have to familiarize with the anatomy and open procedures lot of the times you will see that the arthroscopy surgeons and then they will say that tomorrow i will do the open again it may not be all right because they, you have to familiarize with open procedures also the most important is to know the anatomy very well because the exposure of the structures is the key in this type of procedure uh, anyway in any orthopedic surgery it is the exposure of the structures that are that are the key factors you all know that the reverse shoulder is done in a patient where it is like if you have a four part fracture and you cannot reconstruct it in very elderly patients you presume that you may not be able to reconstruct then you again you go for a reverse shoulder but basically this invention was mainly for an arthritic shoulder where the cuff is not there so when the cuff is not there you have to think about a reverse shoulder arthroplasty because the surgical planning involves you need to understand the deltoid function remains the key if the deltoid is working very well then you take up the surgery in case if there is a previous injury is there and then patient had any sort of an axillary nerve or neuropraxia please don't do it and then if you, if it is very much contracted and then deltoid is not working to the full extent again don't do it so all these you have to take into account so the first criteria is that make sure the deltoid is working very well and then each of the shoulder that you operate so if it is an arthritis whether what type of an arthritis is it is it just like a regular osteoarthritis or a rheumatoid arthritis or a cuff tear arthropathy all these you need to differentiate and then plan your surgery because the glenoid wear may vary from one to the other and also if it is a cuff tear arthropathy sometimes the acromion may be thinned out so much that if you pull your deltoid to the del what we do as a distalization in in reverse shoulder you might also break the acromion so you have to be very careful so you need to understand and evaluate the acromion status so other other things like muscular atrophicity osteoporosis and trauma situations you need anyway you will have to analyze properly and because the trauma situation in the sense when you do the reverse shoulder for as a primary procedure in a case where you cannot reconstruct following a four part fracture in the elderly they all do very well 
on the contrary if you are doing it for a post fixation and then you go ahead and do the surgery sometimes they may not do well so you have to take all these into account and then plan your surgery a various classification for arthritis and also for the cup tear arthropathy but i am not going to dwell in deep to this what you need to look at is the preparation like previous day and before you uh, nicely clean it up fluoroxidin you can use it to clean your the skin and then of course prophylactic antibiotic you would also give and when it comes to anesthesia we always do give a brachial block and then give a general anesthesia as well brachial block when it is given it gives post operative pain relief in a better way and all these patients you know that everybody would because they are coming in elderly age group the comorbidities will be high and then when the comorbidities are high it is always you need to take care of them and then the like the anesthesia is very important because sometimes if it is if the anesthesia is not proper and you have a problem then your reduction of process also will become difficult so you need to make sure you have a excellent anesthesia during this procedure and the position of course you can do in a supine position or you can do in a beach chair position but what is important is that your arm must swing across so you may your arm must be nicely swinging from flexion to extension at the side of the table and if you can get it done then you probably in any position you can operate and of course whatever whenever i do i make sure that they are in a beach chair position like this and also i tilt, tilt the table so that the it is uh, patient is tilted towards me and then every one of you must make sure that the lights are arranged very well during this procedure and if you make sure that then it will be easier in the beginning itself so there are two approaches that are there for this uh, reverse shoulder one is the delta pectoral approach and the anterior superior approach all my procedures so far i have done only with delta pectoral approach i have not tried an anterior superior approach purely because of my orientation and my practice all the open procedures that i have done are with delta pectoral so i am very happy doing it and each of the approach has got its own advantages and disadvantages so you must understand that so in advantage in a delta pectoral is that you always preserve the deltoid muscle it gives gives good exposure to the lower pole of the glenoid to facilitate glenoid implant positioning possibility of inferior extension to control the proximal humerus similarly like uh, if you take the anterior superior approach people would say it is a simple approach the axial like preparation becomes easy there and then whatever the glenoid can be easily seen as a very good frontal view can be given but each of them also have a disadvantages so you just have to make sure that whatever you are comfortable with you can do and i am sure pretty sure that all of you would have been comfortable with delta pectoral approach anterior superior approach is just an extension of it which you can practice and then you can uh, do that also but it's also important that the jigs that are made in some of the companies also depend on the approach some of the times the cutting jig is uh, for a delta pectoral approach some of them is given for an anterior superior approach so when depending upon the approach you choose the cutting jig that you also must use can also vary and this is the this is how it varies and then you need to look at it and then uh, use the appropriate jigs so the delta pectoral approach is the commonly used as i said here deltoid is not disturbed if you want to do an extensile exposure on the entire humerus if you want to access like for example if there is any of the fractures that need that is going down or a tumor surgery that you are doing or any revision surgeries that you do it gives you a extensile exposure and also you can see the inferior placement of glenosphere very easily i am sure that all of you would uh, know the delta pectoral approach so first is to uh, like coracoid remains your lighthouse and then the delta pectoral approach your capelle identification of the capellic vein is the first part and then whether you shift it medial or lateral depends on the way you have been practicing but in all probability like see like if you shift it to medial the chances of injuring it during the surgery is very minimal suppose if you keep it lateral then though they say that the tributaries of the deltoid is maintained 
but still sometimes when you are going more proximal there is a chance that you must injury you may injury whether you shift medial or lateral it doesn't matter as long as the way you look at it because the tributary is coming from the deltoid even though if you ligate it for a post uh, surgery if there is no functional disturbance in the deltoid though it can cause little bit of venous congestion for some time it will all be all right later day one of the area that you also need to look at is there will be a a branch from the thyrocromial near the coracoid it's called the deltoid branch which if you are not careful it will bleed a lot so make sure that when you are dissecting itself you identify the vessel and then ligate it off it will be easier for you and of course as you come down the circumflex vessels would be there which you need to identify it and axillary nerve also you can palpate it and know that where it is because you immediately after the exposure and then if you pass and finger underneath your coracobrachialis and then over the subscapularis and then down below you will be able to palpate your axillary nerve and then you can also uh, note it down the level at which it is there there are various steps that you need to do like a subscapularis release ca ligament release and then the humeral release depending upon the various ways in which the contracture has taken place the subscapular is release that you do many times because we, we will always see there will be a lot of internal contracture so in all, all those areas you love you may have to do a subscapular is release but there is also a controversy regarding whether to repair a subscapular is or not so many issues are being discussed but however let us not go deeper into it but if you are able to repair a subscapular is it is always good because subscapular is the best you know the important muscle in a rotator cuff function so subscapular is you must always aim to to repair it so the humerus cut that you make also depends like for example whether you are making a very horizontal cut or a little bit of vertical cut again makes little bit difference but however nowadays the point you, we, we could discuss later in this talk also humerus release is something like you will have to think about it the glenoid preparation remains the key because you have to get a circumferential release you have to see it like a end on view you must see and then make sure that you circumferentially release the glenoid suppose if you are not able to if it is very tight you will put up you will your glenosphere will be in the antiverted position the retractors that you use must be perfectly placed in such a way that it does not disturb any of the uh, your procedure at later time you must be con constantly be knowing about the anatomy of axillary nerve and then the reamer position all of them will help you to get a good uh, glenosphere ct sometimes it so happens that when it is very osteoporotic you will have to be very careful that you see like uh, this when we were operating at the end of uh, glenosphere tightening the entire glenoid broke so when this happens then it is a nightmare for you to get it sorted out again so anyway but we need we needed to release little bit more and then go on to uh, fix it and also use the uh, plate and then get it sorted out like this so that is how you have to salvage it like so you have to be extremely careful see it's suddenly disastrous when this happens so please do not be just entering into this reverse shoulder arthroplasty just like that make sure that you know everything about it and then start doing the reverse shoulder arthroplasty and also when you are doing this uh, uh, replacement see like the amount of release that you do is very important the release must be so in such a way that all around the glenoid when you are uh, releasing it you must also when you are going down do not disturb the triceps insertion if you the triceps if it is uh, released then again there will be weakness in, in in extension of the elbow and then it also causes little bit of trouble so you have to be very careful with that also so you can see that you use the cautery all around as you use the cautery all around slowly and then dissect it out and then as the dissection goes around and then use these instruments nicely and then get to know the inferior position very well and take out all the 
soft tissue attachment and then of course next area is to get the preparation of the uh, glenoid so you all know that it is pear shaped and the inferior portion of your glenoid is the one that is circular in nature and then you have to mark the center of this uh, 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 circle so always if you mark that properly then your glenosphere also will be seated inferiorly the inferior seating of the glenosphere is very important so this way this is the way you make it so you can see that if you draw a circle from the inferior margin to see like if you draw this so this is the circle that you can make and then take the center of it and then by drawing a line from coracoid base to the uh, inferior margin here and then anti so horizontal line and then this center generally if it is uh, controlled like that and then make your entry point little bit tilted inferiorly your glenosphere will always look inferior suppose if it is tilted superiorly it is again a problem so 15 degree inclination is okay or neutral you can go now you should never ever tilt it superior so that is what is very important and also there is something called 12 mm rule so 12 mm rule is that if you draw that circle and then when you have your uh, center position and then if your glenosphere comes nearly around 12 mm that uh, center hole comes nearly around here then invariably your seating of your uh, glenosphere will be uh, perfectly placed onto the distal portion of your glenoid and also i have already told you the direction of the rimming so the direction must be that it's almost be tilted inferiorly never ever superior tilting so if you do it superior tilting then the notching and all those characteristics of problems do start happening so it has to be tilted neutral or into the inferior direction so this is what we have already talked about and then once you get that right and of course you will also get it right and you all know that when there is a superior uh, wear then you have to make sure that the direction is also correctly positioned in such a way that you don't go in the direction of the wear but you have to be neutral in in that position so in the ap as well as uh, in the lateral view these are the points that you need to uh, remember so once it is uh, reaming is done then you have to seat the metaglin and then uh, nicely all the screws has to be inserted and then a lot of various prosthesis are available so i generally use the evolutis prosthesis but uh, the pew as well as a uh, lot of other companies were there but at least consistently this company uses the prosthesis so this is what has be has to be taken see like what i am telling you in this pictures is that always it is better to position it distal so keep should make sure that it is distally placed So these are all mainly to avoid notching, correct notching that can happen in the uh, in these procedures, notching of the scapula. So here again, you see like the once the humerus preparation is done, then you need to cut it and then get this uh, position properly, and then once it is a uh, uh, trial process done, then reduce it, and then the re once the reduction is done. what you need to do is that stability has to be checked the stability is checked by doing the pistoning but either you try to distract and see generally because it is nicely uh, get into position you will not be able to uh, have any play between the glenosphere and then the uh, humeral uh, implant if there is any play that means it might dislocate so you have to be very careful so you need to adjust it again and then uh, put a Uh, plus five processes suppose if there is uh, and also the other way to check the tension is that uh, check for the conjoint tendon you all know how tight it would be in a normal uh, position so you know at the end of the procedure if you, whether it is tight or not based on that again you can check whether the uh, stability is all right and also like take it to abduction and internal rotation if it is nicely positioned held very well that means it is uh, stable in position So all these things you can check it, and once the stability is all right, then generally, and then take it in all directions, and then make sure that in all the directions it is held very well, 
and post operatively if you if this test is good then generally doesn't dislocate one of the common problem is instability so a lot of uh, articles are there where they have gone the instability rate is as high as 22% that means one in five can have an instability so be careful to sort it out at this stage itself suppose if there is any sort of uh, instability then you have to alter your processes or get the lint all right and then do at this stage and also sometimes when you are doing this the problem is also where if, if the stability part is not okay then it can also dislocate so we had uh, so far we have done 74 patients of them i think two had a dislocation and then both of them sorted out with the in, increasing the size of the prosthesis both on the uh, on the glenoid side as well as on the humeral side so both of them have been sorted out in that way. So it will require a revision if there's any instability. If you think that you can reduce it and get away, many times it may not happen that way. So you will have to revise it. So now the subscapularis repair is something that is always talked about. So you need to remember that subscapularis definitely has to be repaired very well. I always try to repair it whenever it's possible. So there is no question of saying that there is no need for it but it's always good because internal rotation is gained by the subscapularis. So this is a patient, you can see that they, I'm just not going to give all the examples. I'm not going to tell about case after case about all the reverse shoulder. I'm just trying to give you the points where it is very important for all the beginners to make sure how the reverse shoulder needs to be carried out properly. So this is the, this is the actually it came after a failed uh, a rotator cuff repair. So previously an attempt was made about the rotator cuff repair, it was failed. And then when they came and then they, uh, we didn't have movement. So what we did was like, uh, go ahead and do this uh, reverse uh, shoulder arthroplasty. And then you can see that at 10 months, he regains a good movement. And also you see the amount of movements, both internal and external rotation. He's extremely happy about this. And then once, all these are then see like uh, when he recently when i just wanted to ask him sir how are you then he immediately sent me these pictures so he is so happy so that means reverse shoulder is one of the good operation provided if you do it very well in the right indication it is applicable to all the surgeries in our orthopedic field like when it is used any of the technique that is used for a right indication then they all work very well so with this I would like to go ahead and demonstrate what, see this is, this is recently I demonstrated in our, uh, when there was the IAA con conference was going on, they asked me to demonstrate a, a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. This is a 70 year old gentleman who cook by profession and we are having a problem for four years and then overhead activities with pain was completely difficult for the last one year. And you can see the complete wasting that is there of the cuff muscles. Our movements were completely restricted. And then uh, once he was there, we tried to uh, uh, tell him about it. He was immediately happy to undergo the surgery. And these are the ways by which you evaluate. You can see the x-ray, there is a superior migration. And also with this, uh, this, this uh, stage two type of uh, uh, problem, and then we try to take the MRI and the CT to rule out all, whatever the wear that we need to check out. And then also the Gautelier index, everything is checked. So once you know that it is a cuff arthropathy, and then you go ahead to uh, do the uh, surgery. And then this is what we were demonstrating recently. You can see that moment the incision is made from the coracoid to the middle of the arm, about 10 to 10 to 12 centimeter incision you can choose. And then, as I said, you just have to make sure that the capillary vein either, I always retract it medially. So once it is retracted medially, the next one is to identify the coracobrachialis. The coracobrachialis has got a red stripe as well as the white stripe. The red stripe indicates the lateral margin, go lateral to that. And then once you go lateral to that margin, then you will be easy to see the next structure. And then that will be the subscapularis. So here, what I'm trying to do is the pectoralis ma major insertion superiorly, the falciparum ligament would be there. Just try to cut it off. You will immediately see the bicep. 
and also at that stage you release at the six o'clock position of the humerus to nicely release it because that is the key that you need to remember. If you remember, if you release it at that level, then generally the contracture, everything that slowly will get relieved, and then you go ahead. Then subscapularis you need to separate. If the subscapularis is intact, you peel it off nicely from its insertion. In this case, the subscapularis was also torn, and when it was torn, we just take off those fibrous tissues. So I just do the tenodesis of the biceps, and then once the soft tissue tenodesis is uh, done. Then you go ahead to look into the, uh, you just bring out the humeral head. So now I, I have already said that you go ahead and release at the six o'clock position. You start doing it and then you carry on with your dissection. As you dissect down and then you just externally rotate. As you externally rotate, you also know that the axillary nerve will slightly move out of your the dissection area. And then uh, as you externally rotate, and also release more on the inferior portion, then you will know that uh, you will be able to gradually bring out the humeral head. And, and once it is done, you can uh, use your, ask your assistant to push it up and also adapt it. The humeral head will come out into your good vision. Then as this is the mark that I do that is posterior to the glenoid, uh, that is the biceps intertubercular sulcus, posterior and area that medially, then you make an entry point, it will be a more central portion and then mark it correctly and then use those jigs to get your uh, angle correctly done. You can do the cut properly at this stage. Once you cut it, then you are ready to go and introduce your uh, rasp and then go on to remit. Get the humeral preparation done. As the humeral preparation is done, make sure that if there is any offset or any of the, if you think some of them could impinge on the uh, uh, glenoid, you remove the bones that are next to it and then get the rasping properly. And they see like the, each of the time that you do, you always make sure that the mark that is a 20 degree retroversion that I do, make sure that it is going correctly into the forearm. The forearm is your alignment guide at this stage. Once it is done, once the humerus is prepared, then you go on to the glenoid. In the glenoid, your biceps anchor is the one that is going to give you a clear idea as to where you dissect and use that biceps anchor, pull it slowly down. And then from there, you circumferentially keep dissecting out. And then once you dissect it, dissect it then you can completely remove the entire uh, biceps along with anterior labrum and the posterior labrum together. And then everything is visible for you. Once it is visible for you, then you see that all the margins, then you are able to uh, pull it out and then once you are pulling it out like this you can see that I was marking it as a 12 millimeter rule and then once you know that it is perfectly aligned make sure that you are going properly in this direction and then you, next is to complete your procedure like this. As you complete the procedure like you put the metaglin and then on top of it you bring uh, this uh, glinosphere and then nicely tighten it. And then here you, because our experience, we found out that we must not be over tightening it. As, as you, if appropriately tightened, then it must be good enough. And then as you keep it nicely correct, so you can see that you are tightening it here. And now it is glenosphere has been applied. Now you come back to the humerus site and then do the trial reduction put in the stem and then do the trial reduction. And once the trial reduction is done, it, give you, it will give you the best idea as to what is the size that you need to use. So here in this good system is that you can also adjust your uh, 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 trial processes and then get it reduced and checked. So now when you are removing it, if it's tight enough, when you are removing it, you can reduce the size and then dislocate it, it will be easier for you. So moment you, you, are, you are comfortable and you are right with that, then the final one is to get your uh, real process is in. And then once the real process is in, one of the technique is that don't hit it too far in with this because when you are putting the, your, 
humoral component now so when when this is being used and then tightened and then when your insert is being hit on to this it might sunk in so make sure that that doesn't happen so you have to be very careful and then you know when you are hitting it if you have hit your prosthesis much before earlier then it will again sink in so you have to be careful so make sure that it is done then once it is reduced then you need to check for the stability and then once it is stable stable in all directions you know that you have completed the procedure extremely well and then you go go home happily and then the patient generally gets a good outcome out of this so this is about the technique because nina told me that we need to speak about the techniques so i thought i give this uh, uh, take this opportunity to tell you about this uh, technique as a whole so mukesh yes sir excellent demonstration sir step by step in detail right from position to incision to how to reduce and all uh sir any tips because axilla is too close and we all know the two major complications of reverse shoulder is one dislocation and second infection two major complications other than minor so any tips how to avoid infection because axilla is too close mm, see like um, lot of shoulder surgeons do discuss about this infection because uh, uh, and as you rightly pointed out the axilla and then the sebaceous cyst and all those things are there but i don't want to go in deep into it but see, as i said i we always use the chlorhexidin prep to in okay. the previous day and then twice we do it and then we make sure that and then we when the patient comes in they are all in sterile preparation over that area so like that we it is question of taking the precautions but i don't think we can only never, one can, thing uh, i need to address yeah. i use a separate small io band and seal the axilla first and yeah. then use the other io band for this mm. so that you can just seal that axilla yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 i also use only delto pectoral approach as you have shown very elegantly uh, secondly uh, after reduction i want to know how you check the stability how tight you keep or how loose to keep how you check it so generally after procedure i don't want any play between the two components so i just make okay. sure that when you are pulling it it must be make you must make sure that you are pulling the glenoid rather than the uh, humeral component so separately the shaft so should be naked yeah yeah so when that happens then you are really good and of course the other pattern that the people will talk about is you are testing the uh, coraco brachialis tightness that all you can you can, you can you can see you can see but the the biggest test comes when you take it into abduction and internal rotation so if in that position if it is good then generally it is all right sir and we should always avoid over tightening because that will lead to some brachial neuralgia over tightening yeah. or lengthening of the limb yeah, that that is because a lot of tilting and then too much of distalization also results in a problem especially if if acromion is weak if the cup arthropathy has made the, uh, your acromion too smaller too thinned out then you might also break your acromion so you have to be very careful so it's a balance that you need to do so uh, like any replacement surgeon you speak say for example in a knee or uh, uh, hip they always start saying that component position and soft tissue balance it always you hear also it applies the same so any yeah please nil and word uh sir is the risk of instability more in like comminuted fractures compared to arthritic shoulders mm see like arthritic shoulder per se th there is some amount of contractures and things like that would be there which is going to give you some tightness whereas in in these uh, elderly patients when you are doing as a primary procedure because of the inherent inbuilt Uh, nature see like what happens when there is a fracture you know you all know that there is an inferior subluxation is in pseudo paralysis sets in on all these uh, patients so your muscles may not fire as much as you want it in these patients sometimes that is the reason that instability can happen in a fresh trauma fracture fresh injuries 
whereas in all others it is okay so it doesn't matter i suppose but that is my experience otherwise nina uh, to add to it i think if you are doing reverse in any fracture scenario you have gt and lt attached muscles with it so reattach them because they do well for rotation and they provide stability as well okay yes correct yeah right one question one question please yes please yeah yeah, yeah neha please. yeah uh, so good evening dr neha here good evening uh, yeah so what are your technical pearls for uh, cases with uh, glenoid bone loss cases with glenoid bone loss glenoid bone loss is a separate entity by itself so i can talk for more time <laughs> but Uh, but you see, like there are many ways. But you can also use extra components or bone go bone grafting techniques. So so much has been described. But majority of the times, it is easier to manage based on the bone loss. You have to ream the opposite side to get it into a right position. If you can get that, it is okay. But when it is an excessive bone loss, yes, you have to get a. Extra bone over there, and then graft it, and then do it. So it's a little tricky, but it can be done. Yes. Okay. So thank Muk you. Mukesh, Madan yeah. can. Mukesh can tell more about because yeah, he said by your RSCS and recently. Uh, these are usually rheumatoid patients who have a A2 type of glenoid, where you have a concentric central glenoid where, and the whole biomechanics of rivers is we need to lateralize the center. you can put in that medialize but then it will reduce the liver arm and the patient may not function so to lateralize either you can do bone graft from the head itself or you can use an iliac crest bone graft and you can lateralize it at least the vault should be like 2 to 3 to 2.5 cm so depending on your pre op calculation how much is the bone loss use that much amount of uh, bone graft or we also have augmented base plate so if you have a superior bone loss you can have an augmented glenoid where the base plate is thicker superiorly and thinner inferior that was a very good implant from exatec unfortunately they have withdrawn from the indian market sir which is a good implant for beginners i to don't me, want to say it is very simple Yes, so please go ahead. I don't want to say which company and all, but as far as I know, and then my usage is concerned, actually all of them work very well. But Evolutis is at least supplying to us routinely whenever we ask, because there is no crunch from the uh, the industry side, and also it is simpler. Very as he said it, it is very simpler. Yeah. To add to it, they only come with two box. <laughs> yeah. to autoclave yeah. is simple the technique is simple like zimmer and other they have all seven eight boxes and little complex but all are good as told by them so and do we always have to use two screws to fix the glenoid component i use three not two i use three superior and inferior is a must i yes. always put additional one as a safety side so in porotic all four in good stock two is minimum but as told told you can superior inferior is a must so how important is post op rehab because it's i think since deltoid is the workhorse so in most of the cases deltoid might be wasted because of long uh, chronic conditions so no like uh, deltoid is never wasted as such. anyway if you are, if you are worried about it in mri itself will it will give you a clue as to how much of fat infiltration is there all those things you will definitely get a fair idea of uh, deltoid uh, toxicity and things like that but whatever it is see like once you decide to do based on the mri findings if you think and of course in the examination itself you must check for abduction and check your muscles are firing or not all if you don't do that then you are lost you must make sure deltoid is completely working then only you must do Okay. So you have to. That is the first point. That's why in my presentation also I said deltoid function is the first point I put it because if you don't look after and you just see the X-rays and you do it, you will be lost. So, so Nina, patients with pseudo paralysis lead need long rehab because 
they usually don't live they just use capillothoracic so it's a disused deltoid atrophy not the whole muscle is lost so one who is able to hold at least for uh, 40 to 50 degrees abduction of forward elevation they usually do very well after reverse okay. thank you any more questions sir there was a one question in the chat which i answered on your behalf uh, dr mr dinesh ayer has asked what are salvage options after reverse shoulder in case of periprosthetic fracture or loosening happening on the glenoid side and there is so less glenoid stock left so what did you answer first because you see like <laughs> i answered him if it's a intra fracture then you have to fix it and proceed as the way you have shown mm. and if it's a pre op glenoid bone loss you can do bone graft or use augmented base plate the intraoperatively if there is a glenoid break it is a nightmare so it is not so easy it is not so easy to because i put it in a picture immediately after that it is happened in one second but during surgery it happens over 3 hours <laughs> so so uh, it, it is not easy so in fact so you will have to, sometimes you will have to come out explain to the patient and then you must uh, plan uh, re plan and then go ahead and do it so it will be a big nightmare yeah. so whereas if it is on the humerus side if you can always manage it with a longer stem and then like any any yeah. peri prosthetic peri- fracture you get in in a, uh is yes, stem component in femur or knee when you do it is the same so there is a question from a past president of us dr ajit fadke sir uh, yeah. what is the cut off age for this procedure sir our youngest age group for reverse shoulder has been 75 so we are we are doing it for very elderly patients we are we have not done it for young patients at all so okay he is asking sir what is the longevity of the implant no i think literature wise also it is not proven yet there are instances where people have said it is more than 10 years and things like that and then if you ask the french surgeons they will say that oh it lasts long it lasts forever they will say but uh, we have started doing over last uh, 2008 was the first case that we did so the so far nobody has come back to me to for revision yet so i think you are okay i think so sir interop if there is acromial fracture yeah. uh, does it happen or uh, and how to manage that so it would so far it has not happened to me but it will become a nightmare if it happens because whatever you do whatever the fixation that you are going to do the fixation method also is very troublesome and then the your uh, uh, results won't be as great as you see in the other river shoulders mukesh have you got any of those no not so yet we have reached 74 now 74 case was the last when i was demonstrating it to us the 74 case so far we have no acromion fracture only glenoid fracture i had and then as somebody asked like a peri peri prosthetic yes i had one one fracture so otherwise it's okay we have just started doing in last 7 years in nagpur i have started doing so mm. numbers are like 12 to 15 so far yeah mm. uh what is average range of motion after surgery is the question from dr farke sir again sir, so i would like sir, to answer that sir I would yeah please say that nearly 60 to 70% get of the patients whereas the remaining they may get a forward elevation but they all struggle with some sort of internal rotation and external rotation so so always to have external rotation try to preserve as much as teres minor and a part of posterior infraspinatus because patient do have good forward elevation and abduction but for activities of daily living like taking a bath combing a hair and all they need uh, external rotation so try to preserve 
arteries minor and posterior infraspinatus. Some surgeons have even done latissimus dorsi transfer along with the revert to get that external rotation. So is the subscapular is always sutured back? And uh, what is the uh, post-op physiotherapy regimen after your? I always try, I always try to suture the subscapularis because it is very good to suture it purely because they gain good internal rotation. Exactly. That is number one. So if you ask me what is the post-op protocol that we use, we always up to three weeks we always do only passive movements. And then after three weeks, I slowly start encouraging the slightly like an external rotation. I start encouraging after three weeks. So within pain-free limit, they will keep doing it. And then sixth week onwards, I am I am a little bit start. I will ask them to keep doing more. And then I never ever told them to do any sort of uh, like the TheraBand exercise or pressure, ex, uh, like uh, against resistance exercise, all those things I will never tell them purely because I don't want them. All these elderly patients just want movement. They are, do they are not interested in strength. So if they, if, they are if they are able to gain movements, they are happy. So yeah. regarding you, need, you, you need not be too aggressive. That's what I mean to say. Yeah. Okay. Totally agree to it. Regarding subscap, try to repair, as I told for internal rotation, as well as it will reduce the dead space, which is their formation of hematoma. And also, to a certain extent, it will give stability to the implant. Okay. If at all uh, the subscap is not repairable in particular patient, so uh, yeah. is, uh, post-operatively, is it uh, different, the uh, range of motion or maybe uh, the stability? Okay. Of it's okay if you're not able to repair it, don't worry about it. Maybe the strength may be less. Sometimes uh, they still manage uh, internal rotation. We have different muscles taking care of internal rotation. Okay, sir. Okay, Nina, happy to see both of you here. So, so I thank Mukesh. So, thank if you're you, all sir. okay, thank we'll... we'll Yes, thank sir. you all. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you. On behalf of Sir Vidar Orthopedic Society, I'm extremely grateful to you for your valuable inputs and time. And it was an honor having you on this program, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I would also like much. to thank Mukesh Ladda, sir, uh, for uh, actually he has conducted this program with equal enthusiasm. So thank you so much for your time, Mukesh, sir. Uh, and I would like to thank Ashok Sham, sir, and Ortho TV for giving us this platform where we could actually involve more viewers. So thank you, Ashok Sham, sir. And Definitely. last but not least, all the Definitely. viewers of their time. Thank you. Definitely thank you so Ashok Sham and all the viewers. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Sir. Yes. Sir. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks a lot, sir. Thank, thank you. you sir. Thank you, sir. Bye. 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 Good night. Sir. Thanks. Good night, sir. Good night. Sir, thank you.